There's a universe inside each of us. The Innerverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garten, and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. All right, welcome to the One Within All, back to another episode of Innerverse. Today, I'm pretty excited because I have a personal hero of mine, somebody that I've learned a lot from on the show today. He's known online as Crow777. That's Crow with two R's. And he's a amateur astronomer, star watcher, turned into a podcast host who has filmed some very interesting things, including a phenomenon called the Lunar Wave, which I highly recommend you check out on his YouTube channel. I'll make sure I post that in the show notes. Just a short couple minute video will show you something you never would have probably imagined possible regarding the moon. And on top of that, he's a general researcher into many things, spiritual, conspiratorial and health related, kind of an all around go to source for a lot of different types of knowledge. So I'm really excited to be talking to him today. I've adopted several of his catchphrases as things that I like to say myself now, including Belief is the enemy of knowing. History is a lie agreed upon, and there is no lie in nature. So maybe in the second hour, we might get into a little bit of spagyrics and alchemy. Very fascinating topics. But in the first hour, we're going to be talking about the starry vault above, some of the weird things Crow has seen up there. And uh, let's go ahead and get started. You can find his work at crow777radio.com. That is with two R's in the Crow, linked in the show notes. And Let's go ahead and kick it off with the Lunar Wave Papa and World Conspiracy Stopper. What's up, Crow? Hey, man. Thanks so much for having me on. And to be fair, one of those sayings, I believe, is attributed to Napoleon. <laughs> uh, history is a lie agreed upon or some semblance of that. And the other thing I would mention is we now know that the wave is not peculiar to the moon. It can be filmed all across at least the ecliptic. Wow, that's pretty cool. I didn't actually catch that. I've been combing through your archives and maybe just haven't got to the point where that's been revealed. But do you want to go ahead and tell people a little bit about what these interesting things that you filmed are and some of your thoughts on it? I know you don't like to be too definitive, but there are some observations that have been made for sure. Right. I I can't tell you what it is. Um, I, I suspect it has something to do with what we call the firmament. Uh, as time went on and it took years, a year and a half, I was still the second only the second guy who had filmed it. Um, but others have filmed it lots of times in front of the moon. I don't even know how many times it's been filmed in front of Jupiter and Saturn on more than one occasion. Um, and so that tells us kind of the path of the sun, the moon, the planets, the ecliptic. We know it can be filmed in these areas, uh, but it remains to be shown exactly what it is. People have tried to say it's planes. Um, the first one, was filmed on accident, but everyone I filmed after that, I had binoculars and I searched the sky for a cause and couldn't. Uh, One person who filmed it claimed he saw a plane, but it was kind of bizarre how he explained it. There wasn't a lot of credibility there. And so if something like that really was causing it, it's invisible and silent. Um, And not only that, you can go look up what a bow wave or what they call a bow wave from a plane is there's there's some footage on youtube of a supersonic a jet going supersonic in front of the sun so you can see the waves and what you notice is the waves are different and every surface plane on the vehicle each wing each tail protrusion every one of them makes a wave and the nose of the plane as well so i don't accept that as an explanation but who knows what it might be yeah really it It's super weird looking to describe it verbally. It's almost like that type of tracking distortion that happens on old VHS players whenever the tape is a little wonky. Really strange. Um, But there's also a couple other funky things that you've filmed as well, like the second sun, which I found really fascinating, especially whenever you're talking about this idea of a firmament or a sort of a solid dome around barrier around the the. uh, planet for lack of a better word um i'm sorry it dropped out for just a second repeat that one more time please oh yeah sure uh the second 
the sort of second light source behind the sun during eclipses. That's another very strange thing that you filmed. Is uh, that something that you would mind describing to the audience a little bit there, too? Well, I think what you're referring to is for years I filmed every eclipse, transit of Venus, lunar solar. Um, and what was it, 2017 in August or something like that, when we had the first full solar eclipse here in this country again, um, I proved to my satisfaction definitively that the moon plays no role in a solar eclipse. And I think that's what you're referring to. But also the idea of the source sun or the second sun or the invisible sun, um, I think you might be mixing those two ideas, but I'm not really sure. I, I definitely might be. <laughs> uh, definitely might be. But so, so basically, during the eclipse, um, we set out to do a single thing, and I did it across many, or I set out to do a single thing, and that's simply detect the moon coming into a, an eclipse, and it can't be done. I had full spectrum tools, couple scopes, all kinds of filters, camera, light obliteration, multiple cameras. Um, and by the way, the full spectrum was a DSLR converted to full spectrum. You can't detect the moon. It's not there per se. Um, and then all of a sudden this thing's taking a bite out of the sun. And so where I am now is I think the Vedics told the truth. It's the nodes. Like anyone who knows about Western astrology will always see the nodes listed in an astrological chart. Um, it's called Ketu and Rahu in the Vedic tradition. People can look those ideas up. So I would estimate that way back they were accurately describing what is misdescribed now. I think that's super fascinating because I... It's, it's just weird how belief gets in the way of actual observation of things. I remember during the 2017 total eclipse that came across the United States, I actually live in an area where the totality could be viewed. And I was out at an event with hundreds of people looking at this totality occur, most of them covering up what they're seeing with those eclipse glasses that are so popular. And... Um, not only is there no moon visible at any time during the day leading up to that, despite the fact that on other days you can see the moon during the day if it's in that if it's an appropriate part of the sky, there was actually a chemtrail plane that covered or that um, flew right across the eclipse during this totality, right above where all the people were watching this occur, and it crossed the ecliptic of the sun or the point right where the light came uncovered as the uh, node, if you will, started to move away from the sun, right where that first gleam of light started to shine through. At that exact moment, a chemtrail plane intersected and, and went across that gleam. And nobody at the event saw it except me and one other person who amazingly happened to get a photo of it right at that moment. But I went around asking folks, did you see the plane go across the sun? And it was like, I don't know what you're talking about. So it's it's incredible, I think, that um, that that phrase belief is the enemy of knowing has holds so true, even with things that people are apparently observing with their own eyes become invisible or unrecognizable. Well, the the, the spraying uh, every major celestial event, particularly in the daytime, uh, there's been spraying. And this time was no exception. As a matter of fact, it got so bad, we couldn't see the sun. So I kept filming with a full spectrum camera that could see through it. And then even eventually that wasn't good enough. So it's pretty clear. I mean, really, you're going to go spray trails in the air when everyone's looking up at an eclipse. This has gone on and on. It's happened during, I think, every major uh, astronomical event that I've tried to film here. There was uh, a planet going to get occulted or go behind the moon. I was trying to prove that the moon see through at points. But... By definition, uh, the moon would be new that close to the sun, but the Tibetans have an old saying, the closer the moon gets to the sun, the darker it gets. Um, the point is, is that's provably not the moon causing the bite out of the sun and the blockage of the light. Yeah, and oddly enough, this conversation just reminded me of a crazy dream I had last night where I can't recall all of it, but the moon essentially was no longer a thing in this dream at some point. And it was a somehow a, a better world because of it, but I really can't remember the details. But the chemtrail question, as far as why why are they spraying, could I like how you put it, usually when things are happening from the, the allies or the elites, it's uh, like 50 agendas being played out at once. But I wanted to, since we are talking about chemtrails, give a shout out to our mutual friend, Matt Landman, who's made a great documentary, at least covering the history of 
geoengineering and I've got one of his uh, Spiro hats right here, EMF protection hats. Great guy. Make sure everyone remembers that they should look up his uh, documentary and also some good episodes on your show back in the day. Yeah, um, it's been quite a while since I've spoke with Matt. Um, by the way, Jason uh, did a documentary. My co-host did a documentary called Shoot the Moon that's on Vimeo that covers nearly every interesting thing I filmed through the telescope. Um, that's actually won eight awards, believe it or not. When he first put the documentary out, almost no one would touch it. Then finally, someone did accept it. And then it's been in some big places, the Rhode Island Film Festival, um, Jaipur, I think is the name of the city in India. Uh, the Hermetic Film Festival in Italy just gave him a laurel. So he's won eight laurels uh, as a documentary. And actually, I think it, wore, it in a Hermetic Film Festival, it, it won the Paracelsus Award. So it was like real. People are not backing away. They're considering what's being said. And, you know, we're saying a lot of things there. We're basically saying we don't accept what NASA has been laying down. I cover the double sun idea in that film. Uh, we cover the eclipses, all of it. And uh, people are watching it and appreciating it. So truly, uh, we're in a bit of a time of change here on more than just the news front. Yeah, dude, I totally feel you. And what I think is good for as far as being hopeful about the world, especially in 2020, when many people are seeing things quite darkly <laughs> through a dark lens, uh, the, the fact is people that turn on and wake up to the pursuit of truth. Maybe they don't have the truth yet. I mean, no one has the ultimate truth, but we're on the pursuit of it. They don't tend to go back to sleep, reinsert into the matrix, if you will. It's like, uh, once we get people on our side, they don't go back. Uh, there's no revolving door, but I'd love to maybe segue into talking a bit about NASA and how, like, if you could help give people some pointers to get on the path to realizing that NASA lies about a lot of stuff. Um, everything about where we live seems to be um, skewed to some degree. And I think we're just kind of moving into an age now where all that's going to fall by the wayside. Uh, we're in a time of change. I think a lot of people are worried that the change is going to be horrible. Uh, I'm hearing from some people who should be in the know that it might be far from that, but it remains to be seen. But it doesn't undo the fact that people have kind of woken up enough to start to observe and quit just accepting everything they're told, go out, challenge it, do observation. Uh, and this is how it starts all over again. And we learn all the things that we apparently used to know. Yeah. So what are some of the uh, things that we accept as dogma and doctrine about the place we live that are very challengeable in your opinion? I think just about all of it, even the idea of maps. Um, you don't even know the shape of the continent for sure that you're standing on, and that's provable. You can take every projection they make, lay them side by side, and they're all different. So how are you going to grab one of them and act like that one you chose is correct? And that should have went away the moment they took a picture of Earth from space, which they've never done. Um, you know, all those images are now admitted to be artist renderings. The last guy, I think the one they put out on the iPhone in 07 or whatever it was, I don't remember the year. Um, that guy's name was Simmons. He was an artist and admitted um, that it was an artist rendering of what he thought the world should look like. And they were passing these off, even the Apollo stuff. It's all been shown to be just artist renderings. But my point is, is drawing a map out at that projection, not close in where you can see streets, making a continent, the issue should go away once you've taken a shot from space. There it is. There's what a continent looks like from space. But yet we can still hear their argument. Well, it's round. We got to make a flat. So here's 56 projections. And by the way, um, by the time you get to the poles, the, you know, the amount we're off is infinite. In other words, the pole stretches all the way across the map. Um, and, you know, that's not even the half of it. The Mercator projection makes all the small kind of royally driven countries in the middle of Europe much bigger than they actually are. Um, there's all these things going on with these map projections. And, you know, come on, look, look what millennium we're in. Why? Um, it shouldn't be that way. And so when you begin to challenge, you realize that a lot of knowledge, factual knowledge about where we are, what the sky clock is, what's above our heads, what this place actually is, what your continent actually looks like. It's all been obscured. And that earth from space argument, I, I encourage people to go find uh side by side pictures of the, 
supposed Earth from space images that we've been handed from the 70s up to now. And they all appear kind of different. And you can find evidence of things like copy and pasted cloud designs. And there's definitely, I, I believe you've put those type of images through Photoshop, if I'm not mistaken, and been able to use different level enhancements and alterations to show the um, the edit fingerprints, if that makes sense. Like, uh, Well, even if you do that, you'll see even the continents change size. Um, not to mention that all the colors are different on everyone for some reason. And in fact, they got caught on a few of them cloning the clouds. Um, you know, when people started paying close attention and looking at the shapes, they found that. But even the, the supposed uh, Earth rise over the moon, um, before I met Jason, I took that and I showed that the Earth was the wrong size. Uh, because if you, with the information we're given, if you were standing on the moon, the Earth would not be the same size as the moon as if you're standing on the Earth looking at the moon. So the Earth was provably the wrong size, but when you just jacked levels up in Photoshop, you could see the crop marker was pasted in. And after that was outed, and a number of people did it, NASA went back in and cleaned up all the images so that you can't just jack the levels and see the crop marks and show that it was pasted in, which tells you even further um, that they're, they're hiding things, not being honest. Yeah, and there's some, I mean, Really, it's whack. A lot of things about what NASA comes out and says, I, I caught a video that someone shared yesterday or the day before of a supposed NASA astronaut. Uh, I just tried to look it up, but I couldn't find the name. But if I had more time, I could find it. So I might link that in the show notes. But an, a NASA astronaut talking about uh, why we aren't going back to the moon. And he says, well, we used to be able to go to the moon, but we destroyed that technology and it would be very hard to make it again. So that's why we don't go back. <laughs> You'd think that with all the taxpayer funding, that would be the first thing that they might want to do. I, I mean, even the most logical thing. So, you know, basically in a year and a half in the sixties, uh, from the time they seriously started to go at this, they did it, brought guys up and safely back. And so now we're what <laughs> half a century away and we still can't replicate that. It's ridiculous. We didn't even have computers um, per se uh, when they did that. It, it's all, it all bears believability. I mean, if you want to accept it, that's the only thing that keeps this afloat. Uh, they push it and push it and push it. When, and here's the other thing. Common sense tells you that once you do a difficult thing, the next time you do it, it becomes easier, doesn't it? Um, that's not the case here. Even with the space, Port there in truth or consequences, New Mexico. Um, they're simply trying to take something up to the edge of space, drop it back down and reuse it. Um, after 14 years, uh, the guy who owns it said, turns out space is hard, which is a pun from the Apollo days, because that's where that was first said, space is hard, um, but not too hard in the 60s because they pulled it off. Yeah, and there's also the phenomenon of missing tapes. NASA claims they just lost a bunch of d data and tapes from all those missions. Is that correct? Yeah, all the telemetry, all all the all the basic stuff from the moon launches is apparently gone. So the most important, one of the most important endeavors ever, and somebody misplaced all the evidence, um, the original footage, the telemetry. I forget all the stuff. It's it's beyond the pale. It really is. But if, uh, if you try to bring this up to your average person, it's like you're uh, questioning their religious um, freedom or something. It's like you, they get pretty angry. I think that's a, a good sign of the degree of um, under control someone's mind is, is how easily offended they are when you question certain dogma. Because, you know, for me, if you question something that I think I know, I don't get mad about it. I just maybe will try to challenge it in a conversation and, and debate it in a friendly way. But yeah, some of these people, if you debate anything, it's like you unleash the dragon. And I think that's a sign. Hey, we've kind of forgotten how to debate. Debating now is not what debating was when I was young. Debating now is mostly fights for what I see. I don't what I choose to do is just make observations and try to show the best common sense evidence. You can't leave it at that. People, people will do what they will. Um, if they don't want to go down that road, they don't have to. There's no rule says they have to. And uh, it avoids 
having all these arguments and fights, which really isn't helpful to anyone. And, you know, sometimes it'll be the most common sense thing that you mention in an offhand way. It'll catch someone's attention. But um, the world's catching up They're um, They're getting to a point now where they want to know things. Uh, they don't want to just accept them. They observe things. They test things. They challenge things. Uh, we see more and more of that all the time. And also, you know, space is being privatized now, this imaginary thing we apparently do. Um, and the thing about that is when it was a quasi government agency, I guess there could be ramifications if anyone wanted to get serious about challenging where all that supposed tax payer money was going. But with a private corporation, none of that. Those are now all corporate secrets, right? Uh, they don't have to tell anybody anything. So you can see what's going on here. Uh, the privatization of everything, uh, the complete removal of any idea of government. Right. Just moving further and further towards uh, corporate style fascism. And that's definitely what we need to bring awareness to for for the world. And uh, it's probably been we've probably been moving that direction for quite a long time. But there are some fingerprints of old organizations in what we call um, our dogmatic view of space. The fact that the Vatican has control of major ground-based telescopes, for example. Um, a few things I'll throw out there for people to, to look into on their own if they are really curious about disputing the uh, NASA <laughs> worldview. First of all, just try to find some videos where there's obvious use of wires, like uh, people being on wires to simulate the zero gravity idea uh there's lots of that available there's also a great rabbit hole to dive down with the challenger explosion and the seeming hoax of the deaths of those astronauts and that a lot of those astronauts appear to actually still exist or they have a magical twin brother that just appeared right after their uh <laughs> they died <laughs> so lots of interesting stuff there um while we're still a little bit in space let's talk about or so-called space let's just wrap up with talking about the idea of the firmament and and where this where this comes from how this is a much older idea and uh warner von braun the ex-nazi rocket scientist who was migrated over to nasa what he had to say about it well he was the almost the totality that they claim you know he designed he designed all the rockets that no one has been able to improve on he's basically the guy credited with engineering everything that made what they claim happened possible um, but on Werner von Braun's headstone, he leaves two bits of information, the span of his life and a psalm. And the psalm encodes 9-11. I forget what it is, 119 or 19-1. Anyhow, it encodes 9-11. And it basically informs us all that the firmament shows God's handiwork. So what is it, Mr. Von Braun? Did we launch rockets up into outer space or is there a firmament? Um, you can look up the definition of firmament. Most people in this part of the world attribute that to being biblical. But the truth is, is the idea is extremely old and it's all over the world. In our traditions, the idea of separating the waters from the waters. And in some traditions, you'll see it's the more dense physical plane waters that we are in, this kind of physical world we live in. And then the more etheric spiritual waters is part of the idea um, but I filmed for years and I came to the conclusion that nothing leaves our atmosphere, nothing, uh, nothing material anyhow. Yeah, I I can't seem to find any evidence that there's anything leaving our atmosphere either. All I find is contradictions in the uh, supposed evidence that it's happened. So I'll just come out and say I'm earth shape agnostic. I'm not here to try to get anyone to join a group of one side or another flatters versus rounders or whatever. I I'm just interested in asking questions and uh, proving obvious deceptions, which I think you probably would agree with. But what do you think allows the uh, NASA lies to exist with people that work for them even being conned? Um. I, I think that the average person that was working on any of these things was honestly doing their job, being an engineer, designing the things they thought they were designing. Um, it's very compartmentalized, usually, when, when things at this level are done. Um, I don't, for a second, think that the average engineer and all these other people are out there lying or one of a millions or thousands of people holding a secret. I think they were doing their job. Sorry, I've got a new dog, if you haven't noticed, and he's still learning the ropes. 
<laughs> it's okay. Mine's weaving around my legs right now. Anyhow, I, I just think that, that people are given a very compartmentalized task, design this thing, and they do it. Um, and when the things that are not going to be very publicly known, um, they just take measures to cover it up or only have certain people there. Who knows? We, we can only guess, can't we? Uh, but the overarching things that we can demonstrate is that what we've been, we've been shown is provably not correct. I think the compartmentalization definitely stands up as a, a good argument. And you can apply that to a lot of different conspiratorial things, even on a psychological level, when they put someone through something like boot camp, that type of experience of, you know, the hell week that sometimes you have to go through where the, the PT physical training is so difficult. Even that type of experience causes internal compartmentalization. And so that, that concept as a, is a deep one on a spiritual level and on a conspiracy research level. But um, what do you, what do you think about the idea that conspiracy research is a form of spiritual work or development? Do you agree with that? Well, I'm, I'm not big on conspiracy ideas. Um, I don't consider myself involved in conspiracy. We look at things and then we factually draw what we can and we challenge them. We're not making stuff up. Um, I think what's, I think that kind of psychological operation catch all conspiracy is designed to do what it does. Um, but what we, what I got interested in is I wanted to know really some things. I sat behind a telescope for years to try to figure it out. And the further I got in, the more things fell apart. The more I tried to replicate what I was seeing offered me from space agencies, the further away I got. Um, and then it just comes to a point where you're all, Hey, man. Things are not as I once accepted they are. And from that moment forward, you begin to challenge and experiment maybe is a good way to put it. Um, and the other thing is whenever you're doing this, you, you like the Huffington Post took me on one time. I was minding my, they kept taking my video and running it because they can get away with that because they're news. They don't have to ask your permission, but they kept bad mouthing me. Um, and why? Why are you so concerned with some little dude on a YouTube channel that you've got to make an example? So I, I did a rebuttal. I said, you're mistaken. Um, I do understand my equipment. Here's an optics expert. And this thing you're claiming is a satellite at 11,000 miles is completely provable nonsense. It'd be many times the size of the fake ISS if that was true. And by the way, you think this little telescope in my backyard can see 11,000 miles? I got news for you. Common sense flees the scene. Um, and so that's a tell too. If people are just being silly people, if I'm just a silly man for making the observations I do, then why would anyone bother to run an article and make a big deal out of it and take my video? Why would they care? Uh, and that's a tell too, because they're protecting something. Uh, they don't want things challenged. And the truth is, is that science is all about challenging. You're supposed to be able to take anything you're told, try to rip it to shreds. And if you can say, hey, this doesn't hold water. And that's really not where we are. If you go to those religiously held scientific principles and you challenge them, you're going to get swatted around by a lot of people who just want to protect it. So where's the science in that? If it's truly science that you're interested in, then we should be able to challenge this. Try to rip it. Try to poke a hole in it. And if we can, then there's a problem here. And that's supposed to be part of scientific method is to prove that this isn't correct. But we've moved far from that, particularly online, um, because then it becomes, well, you don't have a degree from Harvard. What you say doesn't matter. These kinds of ideas. Yeah, I like whenever you say on your show that if a theory has been around for a few decades, it's probably time to reexamine that from the ground up. <laughs> every, every year, a theory is just an idea that can't be proven. And every year a theory exists, it's less good an idea. That's common sense. If you want to have an idea, a theory to start on a path, that's fine. But really, we've got theories been bumping around my whole life. Theory of gravity is one of them. At some point, doesn't someone have to say, hey, guys, we can't make this a law, so we need to go at another avenue. This theory is not holding water. Um, and, and the other thing is these theories get used um, as foundational. The theory of gravity is, well, what if people recognize that this is only a theory? Maybe there's a better. Is this limiting us? Is accepting these theories as the basis for all these things we do limiting us? 
after all, if it's true in the world, you should be able to make it into a law. And it should not take 50 years or however long it's been. And there are tons of theories around. Right now, the big one you're not allowed to talk about is germ theory, which has been around my lifetime or something like that. I forget exactly how much. Uh, if these things are true, prove them true. Um, you don't just have a permanent theory. A theory is just an idea. It's what it is. Look up the definition. What is a theory? Right. And what's interesting is the individuals I sometimes talk to that will respond to that idea where I say, hey, a theory is just a theory. <laughs> the uh, response I sometimes will receive is, well, you don't understand the difference between theory and a scientific theory. But then they don't ever actually make the explanation to me of what the difference is <laughs> and why the scientific theory is worth being a dogma. I'm glad you brought up that the viral theory idea, the infectious virus idea is very much a theory because although most people have been ingrained their whole life in believing that and <clears throat> everything in mass media has given them a lot of reasons to believe in it, just very, very similar to how the space idea works and how Star Wars and Star Trek and things like that got entire generations enamored with space. The same is true with uh, Hollywood getting the majority of people afraid of the idea of invisible viruses, which is no, in my opinion, it's no different than the idea of an invisible little demons that make you sick. And from my life experience, uh, illness has come as it's been an energetic thing. Like if I run myself ragged, if I don't get enough rest for multiple days in a row, almost invariably what I'll wind up with the symptoms of a cold or sickness and tell I get my charge back in order. And I think it's a simpler way of looking at illness that there's only really one thing going on. And depending on what part of your body has the problematic energy imbalance will determine what type of symptoms you experience, but they've lumped certain symptoms together and said, well, this is this disease and this is that disease. And of course, this doesn't rule out something like bacterial types of infections. It's totally different than than viruses and the idea that we've been presented with viruses. But I think it's very much worth looking into the, the disputing of the viral theory because it's one of the most heavily censored things on YouTube right now. You did a good show with uh, doc, Dr. Kaufman on that that people could find. No, actually, you can't. They removed it. Um, and that goes to tell you, they, I think, I don't know, I've done three or four things with him. There may be one still existing, um, but that that's a tell, too. Why are they so worried? This this guy's a trained MD and a psychologist. Um, uh, so why isn't he allowed to talk? Uh, and when he comes out to speak common sense, it gets censored. Um, that's why I don't even, you know, right now, I don't know where you're going to run this, but if you talk about these things, you're going to get noticed. Um, and that is the biggest tell of all, uh, because truth doesn't need any protection. You know, that's really the bottom line. If you're talking about a thing that is, it doesn't matter who says what about it. Uh, the truth is the truth. It is what it is. And, um, they have been just knocking channels out people you know, recently, I think, in the last week, we've lost a couple channels talking about lockdowns in this part of the world or that part of the world. And it goes to show you what's going on here. Um, that's why we basically choose to talk about things that we think are helpful to people as much as we can. Um, like the, the episode I run tomorrow will be wholly on the idea that you can break addiction in three days. Um, it's, a, it's a heck of a time right now. And I, it can't go on like this forever. I imagine either it gets a lot worse and a big lockdown all the way around happens or something's going to give. Um, doesn't feel like this kind of limbo-y, weird place we're in uh, where you can't even speak as an adult. And it doesn't feel like this can go on as we are now for too much longer. I'm inclined to agree with you that something's got to give one direction or the other. And I appreciate the concern about where I might run this and how it might be uh, impacted that I'm talking about this type of thing. I don't have a huge YouTube following to gamble with. Uh, it's been enough of a battle to scratch a few hundred subscribers out with uh, the way that the algorithms no longer put any favor on anybody that's not, you know, mindless entertainment or a corporate type of thing. But uh you know, luckily, we're not at the point where things like the 
Apple iTunes RSS podcast feeds are being wiped out. And we do have uh, some semblance of safety on uh, the audio only platforms, which is probably more where people are finding this right now. Yeah. Um, if I had to start all over, I don't think it would be possible with what's going on. Um, hold on. Let's go lay down. Go on. Get going. Go lay down. Be a good boy. Um, it's just really not the same. Uh, there was a certain point. You, you hit a certain point where you're picking up a thousand subs a week. And then all of a sudden that starts changing. And now, I don't know, I'm somewhere close to 200,000. I don't even keep track anymore, to be honest with you, because the numbers are just made up. Um, it doesn't reflect reality. And I think I pick up less than a thousand subs a month, certainly, usually closer to 500. I used to pick that up in a day uh, back before all the censorship came. And that tells you something, too. Um, what would this world be if free speech, as long as you're not hurting anyone, directly causing harm to someone, if you were just allowed to speak and truly, if people wanted to follow you, they were allowed to. And that's not what's going on. And that's why so many of us have been forced to get private websites. But then you're faced with the problem of not using a streaming server to get your media out. So you have to pay for your own media serve. And that is hugely not easy to do server resources and everything else. And it's just pushed this way. Um, and so many people act like, um, you know, you're in this totally for the commerce. Actually, what started this was we couldn't have free speech anymore. We had to go to a platform. All these places that give you free this and free that, it's at their beck and call when they want to remove or stop you from speaking. That's why it's free. And also they're taking all the data you put in there for free. Um, that's why private sites have become, but you know, when I first became a webmaster in the nineties for like a hundred bucks, you could put up a site, do everything you need to do for a year or two. Now it's thousands of dollars to do everything you need to do to serve your own content, have enough server power, all of it, just all of it, the name, the secure socket layer, the, just everything that it takes. Um, and some people just can't afford to do it. And if you don't have a following, which will help you cover that cost, um, it's you're back at square one using the free platforms, talking about what you're allowed to talk about and having, you know, getting put in Facebook jail or getting, you know, I actually had my channel deleted uh, with a hundred and uh, I forget over a hundred thousand. I, I don't even remember. I think it was over a hundred thousand followers on YouTube and they just deleted me over a lunar wave video, by the way, that I didn't even shoot. Someone else shot it and asked me to run it. Um, then they put it back three weeks later um, and everything had been changed. There was clearly an algorithm before they deleted my channel. A search for Crow triple seven got like 16 to 20 million returns on search engines. The day they put it back, it was just a few thousand returns. And to this day, if you search lunar wave, you can still clear a million returns. Maybe depends where you are in geography. Um, but if you add my name to it, it goes down to a couple thousand. So you can see what's happened here. Yeah, man, I, I, whenever I go to show people Lunar Wave and I type in Crow 777 Lunar Wave to YouTube, you'd think the first thing that should come up is like whatever your most popular or most viewed Lunar Wave video is. But it's not. It's not even on the first page of results. I have to just go to your your actual channel and uh, navigate through there to find it. So I don't even think it's cleared a million. I, after all this time, I don't think the Lunar the Lunar Wave is known everywhere in the world. So how could it be that that first clip I put up in 2013 um, hasn't cleared a million views. Actually, I, I could look right now. I'll look. I'll go to my most popular. I think it might be about a million last time I looked at the one I saw, but it's it's around that. But it should be way should be way bigger. It's the most it's the most construct breaking uh, film evidence that I've pretty much ever seen. Actually, a book I've been reading this week even mentioned it, which I thought was cool. I think it's more well known than the numbers would allow people to think. But what's really interesting is that what you've been saying about how it's costly to do this free speech thing, which is ironic because it, to most people, they think free speech. Well, it should be free to make your free speech. And they have the illusion of all these corporate choices of different channels and entertainments that because they're not content creators and they're not looking to try to speak freely about controver potentially controversial things that they don't understand that, like you are saying, it costs money at this point in the game. It's not easy. Like even the conversation we're having right now, 
I had to shell out 40 bucks to get this software for a month just to try out a, an alternative to what I had been using because what I had been using was getting worse and worse in quality level and it was a free option. So um, it's, it's hundreds of dollars a month now just to send email. Um, we used to just use a Gmail account or whatever we had. Uh, you can't do that anymore. And what's worse is not only do they not send them, they don't inform you they're not sending them. And then when you begin to dig at the new rules they put in this, oh, you get 100 emails a day or whatever they say. Point is, is you can't run a website and just email all the subs anymore. Now you have to pay a service that will guarantee you're not blacklisted. Um, and that mounts quickly now because of all the ways the pricing scheme. There's nothing about trying to run your own private area uh, to offer information that isn't, I, I don't even know how many times since the, in the time I've done this, it's many times more expensive now than when I started. Um, it's hundreds of dollars a month just for the basic stuff now. Um, and that sets aside everything that goes wrong and the security issues you got to deal with, just everything. Or if you, you know, the, the whole secure socket layer thing, that's another thing they do. Like they'll start tagging your site as dangerous and they won't allow people to click through Google. We've gone through all these things. It's just, it's unreal what goes on in this world. Um, and what's really unreal is these are privately held sites that they are interfering with because they can, they control the throughways. Yep. And if you, you can't afford to develop your own site from scratch on a code level, then you're stuck going through one of these mainstream platforms like Squarespace, where for all we know, that could have the rug pulled out from under you any day, too. But, you know, the, I, I just hope that people hearing this part of the conversation don't look at it like, oh, you poor podcasters, you have it so bad, just c complaining to your audience instead of talking about something important. I think it is important at the very least for people to know that without supporting the type of independent media that they want to see in the world, you're not going to see it in the world at this point in 2020. Yeah, um, I think that's pretty true, but we are at a turning point. Uh, there are people who are supposed to be in the know that I'm aware of that are saying uh, some big things are going to change. And um, I can't say that's wrong. I, I got to see the proof. The proof's in the pudding. Uh, but I'm not adverse to it. I was pretty sure a little while ago that things were going to go downhill until people demanded better. But now I'm starting to see things here and there uh, that hint at the old regime being taken down. And so we're kind of in limbo here. It's hard to make a call. I've been trying to be positive because I think it's important that positive minds, you know, the, the news spends all day every day making you feel horrible, like you've been crushed, like there's no hope. Like all people are just bad. Um, and that's the mindset that gets contributed to the world on the tail of all this. So I've been trying to go the other way. But I think it's quite possible that maybe some of the things we really didn't like about where things had gone are about to get challenged. Well, I love that idea. And I hope that you're right. It'd be cool if we can elaborate that on, on that at all. Because I think what a lot of people's experience of 2020 has been is being locked down in their home, sitting on Facebook or Twitter and um, being really played by this obvious, in my opinion, a very obvious plan of releasing so-called scientific information about things like, oh, masks work. You need to wear a mask. Oh, actually, masks don't do anything. Don't wear masks. And it's like every day there's a contradictory information put out so that some people read the article yesterday, but other people read the, the different article today. And now they both think they got the facts and they're going to go to war with each other in a comments thread. And uh, I don't think that it's an accurate reflection of humanity, despite how many people are kind of caught in that trap. And I'd love it if we can maybe spend the next uh, five or so minutes as we wind down the free hour talking about what things we find hopeful about the potential direction we might be heading in. There's a lot of things you can see in the world that point to pretty sure the Federal Reserve is gone. Uh, pretty sure the form of government we had is gone. Um, reasonably sure that the new high court ruling dealing with the Electoral College uh, was meant to signal that this backdoor to power that we've proved has prevented anyone from ever electing any president in this country. No, president's never been elected. They've been chosen. When you go out to vote, you're polled. That's why they call it the polls. It's the Electoral College that seats them, and it became an old boys club from the get-go. State of Rhode Island refused to participate 
in the founding of the Electoral College, calling it a backdoor to power, which it is. And now the high court has ruled. And all of a sudden, magically, now suppose politicians can go to jail, which is laughable. Why wasn't isn't that always the way things have been? You break the law, you go to jail. Um, but all these new things are going on. And so is it a double reverse? Are we being shown these things to placate us and some other nasty, heavy handed thing is coming or, or are we seeing change? Um, and I suspect there are plenty of highly placed people in this world who have children and families who aren't really appreciating what most of us aren't appreciating. So I think there's hope. Um, but you got to keep your ear to the ground. This is no time just to make a decision that everything is going to be OK. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to be just dumping negative vibes on top of what the news does all day long. Um, but there's a difference there because the news is basically not telling you the truth. The news is owned by very few corporations. And that's why this channel, that channel or any channel are all showing you the same video and telling you the same tale because you're being messaged, you're being programmed. Um, but I think there's reason to hope. What about the Queen of England? What's the story there? She's even flat out said in the press she's stepping down. Uh, there are people saying we were looking at a double for the last so many months. What about that little redheaded royal that's clearly not related to any of them? You know, what was his Patrick or what, what was the redheaded royal son's name, supposed other son um, of Diana? Um, clearly not related to to the other people. Um, he stepped down a while ago. Uh, there was a fake crash at the gate, knocking a coat of arms down that never got replaced. Like they just haven't got around to putting the coat of arms back up. Queen pulls up to the gate and the gate's locked. It's a malfunction. Queen can't get in. Really? Really? That's what's going on here. Something's changing. Um, there is no doubt that something is changing. The, the wholesale question is, is it possible uh, that some of this change will be for our benefit or are we going wholly the other way? And I think most people who watch the news feel like we're going wholly the other way. But we will see. Right. And I wonder sometimes how the collective belief about what direction we're going might inform what direction we actually go. It seems like it, it is a, a factor for sure. And if I, you act like a beaten dog, you'll probably receive what a beaten dog gets. You know, that's really the main thing. If you expect more, then there's a good chance you might get more. And there, there again plays the news, beating everyone down to the ground every night, making you just feel hopeless and miserable about the human race. Uh, having you convinced that this place is just one big sewage canal. <laughs> Which, you know, if you look at nature, it's actually the, not a sewage canal at all. I mean, the earth is still quite habitable and uh, quite a beautiful place, despite some of the the degradation to the planet that has occurred because of, I don't know the, what you would call it. The I don't even like to call it the beast system like some people do because beasts are animals. And even the word animal has I have problems with because when you split those two words apart, it's Annie, which is like spirit and mall, which is bad. So uh we live in a world of amazing creatures, humans included, and uh, we should really spend our time focusing on what's what we're happy and grateful for and what we can build and create. And uh, as far as why I mentioned conspiracy research as a as a spiritual path, it's not so much that it's a spiritual path in and of itself, but that as you expand your consciousness, which is improving your level of awareness of the things around you and inside you, then naturally that's going to be similar to standing on a higher vantage point, higher up, as you can see lower down as well as farther out. Yeah, um, nature is perfect in its delivery to the point where if every human being disappeared tomorrow in a few hundred years, this place would be back to what it ever was, one big animal reserve. Um, this whole time surrounded by lies, what surrounded those lies was perfection. Nature's always been here for us, and this is one of the things um, that gets covered up, that gets lied about, that you're convinced you have to control nature. You need to control the weather instead of recognizing the perfection for what it is. Uh, the example of righteousness, maybe you could view nature. Um, and this is one of the tactics you see. Science does it a lot. Uh, by brute force, we're going to you know, take control of this, that, or the other thing. And really, uh, for the majority of the world, as far as I can tell, people respected the natural world. Uh, the science they did back then uh, only achieved within the scope of what nature permitted. 
There was an idea of balance. Everything was organic. And now look where we are. We're all scrambling to try to get back to the future to make a horrible pun. That's what we're doing. We're all going backwards to these older ideas and the way things used to be because they were better. And nobody is happy with that $200 washing machine from China because it's a piece of crap. And they know it's going to break in the next couple of years. And they just replaced one they had for 35 years that was mechanical because people built that that gave a damn. So everyone is beginning to recognize that we have walked further and further and further away from good things, functional things, perfect things in some view. I'd look at cars as an example. Look what cars were in the 60s and the 70s and the amount. They're, they're almost like art pieces now. Um, the number of colors that were in cars. Look now. A handful of colors for most cars. And by the way, you can't tell the SUV class of one manufacturer from another, like cookie cutter almost. And so we've reached this point where people are saying, you know what? My great grandparents had all organic food and I want to go back there because I now understand they had it. They had it right. So we're literally trying to reverse course here and go back to all these things that worked, um, that have been shuffled aside by science and corporation and so-called globalism and all these things most of us are pretty fed up with. And it is a little bit of a race against time because uh, like some of our grandparents that might be able to tell us how to put together a decent garden might not be here for much longer. And the washing machine reference you made is hilarious because my parents had the same washing machine for 30 years till I was in my early 20s. And then when they replaced it, they I believe they've gone through three uh, different sets of washers and dryers since then in like a decade but they they had the one from the 70s for ages and ages so that, that's a great example and I, let's go ahead and wrap things up here I'd, if we can get you for a little bit on the uh the extension that would be awesome but i would love to talk to you about some alchemy and spagyrics some of these natural sciences that you're referring to the old ways being the best ways and uh give people uh, your information where they can find your your awesome work that you've been doing for so long and thanks for joining me for this conversation it's a real honor and pleasure for me to talk to you man all right thanks so much for having me the only place i mentioned now is my private website crow triple seven radio.com c-r-r-o-w seven 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 radio.com it's the only crow site and there are frauds trying to defraud people now um we we, we lay it all down there but as a as a Closing thought, think, consider the mask thing. You know how many millions of masks are suddenly, you know, it's like a cottage industry now. It's unsustainable. It's like the washing machine. So your parents, like my parents, because I inherited one, 30 some years, 35 years, this washing machine, this mechanical thing, all you had to do is change a belt and you were good for another 10 probably. Um, that's sustainable at a level. These Chinese things, uh, they break in a year or two, then you got to get a new washing machine. So in the same way, creating millions of masks for every living person is an unsustainable model and creates more waste than you can imagine. Where are all those masks going? Are they getting recycled or are they going in the dump? Um, it's all unsustainable. And that's another way we can know this is all coming to a head. For my part, I think if we begin to lift our minds up and expect better and be prepared to demand better, I think that's exactly what we'll get. But the inverse of that is if we sit in front of Fox or CNN every night uh, and walk to bed every night like a whipped, beaten dog in the gutter because of the fear porn spewed venomously nonstop for 24-7 every week, uh, that will be the mindset you can contribute. And by the way, that's one of the main control factors um, I would point out. Yeah, right on, man. And about, uh, one last little thing about the masks. How come you don't have to... Put them in a hazmat waste like sealed bin what the hell <laughs> they should be like super dangerous and it doesn't even matter um you can show up with a bandana um what's that doing it's 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 laughable but not only that not too long ago just wearing a hoodie made you a pr potential criminal now we literally wear the bandit mask everywhere we go it's a clown show yeah, man, I've said it. Well, thanks for being here, dude. And uh, let's just mosey on over to that other side of the break. People can catch it on patreon.com slash interverse linked in the show notes. And uh, we'll see you there. All right. Perfect. All right. Here we are at the outro. Sometimes I don't think you guys realize just what 
it means when I make it to this point. <laughs> Sometimes it's a real relief. Sometimes it feels like a major impediment. Other times I only have so many minutes to work it in before I have something else coming up on the schedule. But here we are. The outro is here. I love it. What a fun episode. I've been looking forward to this one for ages because Crow is kind of a big deal. Not that he would want people saying that about him, probably, but he's worked so hard to bring light to a lot of very murky situations and ideas. And, you know, he's waded through a lot of stuff to try to defeat ignorance and, as he would say, get himself out of diapers. <laughs> and he's brought a lot of us along his journey and helped us a lot. So, Thank you, Crow, for coming on this podcast, this humble show. I know that you have a lot of demands on your time. And man, we did talk about some fun stuff in the first hour. The lunar wave is the thing that if you still haven't paused the show to go watch yet, please do. That is in the show notes. It will rock your paradigm <laughs> unless you're already aware of it. And then you'll be like, yeah, that's still crazy when you rewatch it. <laughs> uh, I wasn't expecting that we were going to get into the question of what you call it, free speech and censorship, right? But it's a big damn deal. And I know he's had to deal with that more than a lot of people and watched many of his <laughs> compatriots out there, uh, people doing the same type of work that he does, get their channels nuked. I mean, Dave Dix from Press for Truth just got his channel nuked and he's been on YouTube for 14 years. So that's insane. And we should all be pretty uh, annoyed about that at minimum, super angry at... <laughs> maybe normal human levels you would be if you were a normal human feeling human emotions you'd be pretty upset i think that what passes for the world's free speech repository youtube is actually heavily censored and a lot of people don't even know how censored it is and how selected the content is for them but i digress that's a topic for another day not really maybe something you want people to complain about and or, you know on your podcast they're listening to you you want some positive ideas that give you uh productive things to think about right you don't need to think about censorship even though it's a big damn deal because we've all probably been witnessing it to this point if you're listening to my show you have to know some degree censorship exists and there's also that caveat about why it's not free to have free speech in the digital age and back in older ages you would have had to spend money to print stuff so it kind of makes sense uh free speech on a mass level that is it's not free to achieve that and youtube proves it not to keep beating a dead horse like <laughs> <laughs> like Crow said in the plus extension, if you act like a beaten dog, you'll probably receive what a beaten dog gets. So here's me trying not to act like a beaten dog, but I do love how Crow challenges everything from nukes to dinosaurs. And even if those things sound crazy to be believing might not, not uh, be worth your belief because <laughs> it really is a belief system. Technically you, you haven't proved that either thing really existed. If you think about it, uh, as Crow says, there's a there there as far as what we're t as far as everything conspiratorial, really. What I've seen in my life is that pretty much everything I took for granted that I was taught when I was young, when I looked into it, the op the opposite wound up being what was true. So that goes for a lot of things to the deepest foundational level. <laughs> uh, so be aware that the world is the world of men and the, the fictions of man, they're not your friend. You have to wade through a lot of ignorance and a lot of lies to get to real truths. And that's just part of what it means to be seeking to know yourself. You need to be able to be honest with yourself at all times to really know yourself, right? Well, that means you got to find out all the ways you're not being honest with yourself, including ways that you didn't even know you weren't being honest with yourself on. So it's a never ending journey because it's technically like an infinite soul progression that we're on probably i mean if we're moving towards the highest self and the point part of ourselves emerging from the creator of the of the all i guess that's kind of an infinite growth paradigm right like those transcendental numbers like fibonacci and pi but hey uh <laughs> keep challenging things don't believe that uh what i'm saying about like maybe dinosaurs weren't the way we're described to uh they weren't real or whatever. Maybe nukes aren't real. Just realize that a lot of things, even virus theory that everyone is so worried about right now, just a theory though. As a little kid, I was always fascinated with the how and why of the big things, the big questions. And I would always explain them even as a four-year-old. But at the end of it, when I was telling someone about dinosaurs, I would always say, it's just a fear we know, which is kind of goofy little kid, cute thing to do. But 
in hindsight, I'm like, wow, that's a woke thing to say, young me, <laughs> because if something's a theory, you need to know that and not take it as gospel, as dogma. I apologize if it seems like I'm talking really fast. I do have, I'm doing an interview with another show right after this, and that's exciting. But also I have a lot of things I want to get in in the next five minutes, but uh, I'll just tell, let you guys all know I'm getting really into biofield tuning. This is a super cool thing. Uh, it's with tuning forks. And I learned about this from a woman named Eileen McCusick, who was on a recent episode of Crow Show. So that'll be linked in the show notes because I thought that was such a phenomenal, phenomenal thing, uh, the conversation that they had. So look out for the anything by Eileen McCusick from biofieldtuning.com. We'll teach you a lot. And tuning forks are, I mean, maybe that's why I'm so jazzed up right now. I tuned myself up right before I sat down to talk. Super real, super cool. I'll talk about that more in the future. If you know me personally, you know, I've already been talking about it a lot. So I should probably uh, go ahead and jump to the part where I tell you what's in the plus extension. I forgot to remind you at all this time, even when I complained about free speech, not being free, forgot to remind you that you can support this podcast and help me uh, pay for all the different hosting costs. I mean, well, this is just a funny story. I don't want to come off complaining, but here it is. Uh, this episode took me a little, little bit more of an editing process than normal. I thought it was going to be a lot more. To cut a long, long story short about why that uh, difficulty came up, it's funny. During Mercury Retrograde, which I think is just now ending or about to end, I made a funny decision to try out a brand new recording software that I'd never used before. And as you might have guessed, that didn't go super well. But my point is, I spent $40 for a month of that software that ended up not even being that great, and I'm probably not going to keep, and maybe not even use for the rest of the month. Luckily, they refunded it, uh, not, <laughs> which is nice, but that doesn't always happen. My point is, uh, other than be careful trying out new forms of communication and technology during Mercury Retrograde, is that uh, you can definitely wind up spending a lot of money trying to do what I'm trying to do. And every little bit helps from you guys. I mean, a plus membership is only $5 a month. So think about it that way. If whatever software switchover I end up going to, because I do need to do something new, ends up being $40 a month like this other thing, how many of you does that take just to pay for that for me for one month? So when you think about the fact that you're giving me money, to a degree, you're not even giving me the money. You literally are giving it to the podcast so we can keep going. And in plus, this time, patreon.com forward slash interverse, if you didn't know, it's in that show notes. So check out for the link there. We talked about spagyrics, which is like the alchemy of plants. Amazing stuff. Supplements, gross thoughts on supplements and uh, carnism versus plant-based eating. We talked about the old model of healthcare versus the modern model of healthcare and the way our ancestors did it, which is kind of a complete inversion. Well, actually, what's now being done is an inversion of what we used to do. <laughs> Basically, uh, it, to summarize, it's about paying the doctor to keep you well instead of paying them when you get sick. But we did also talk about plant-based versus carnism, which is an interesting conversation. Alchemy versus science. We talked about trying out biofield tuning, like I just mentioned. Talked about Crow's advice for truth seekers who may aspire to become truth teachers. And then the last part of the conversation was about the great conjunction that's at the end of this year, astrologically speaking, and maybe kicking off a new age definitely we're kicking off a new decade so whew, let me take a breath <laughs> that was a lot of stuff i fit in but dude do that whichever you are person listening to the show thank you for being here really love you i am going to go ahead and mosey off this recording move on to the next thing but i've got so much good stuff coming in the future i really hope you can get on plus and support the show and get the second hour of all the stuff because that's where the juice is at and I, I want you to get it, but we just have to have a, a model of reciprocation. Otherwise I would kill myself trying to put this out and I'll also do the things I have to do to survive and support myself. So keep that in mind. I'd love your support. I thank you for tuning in anyway. Another way to support me is to just share the podcast with anybody personally in person or the direct message. That's the best way to do it because uh, just sharing stuff on, you know, feeds doesn't go that well. Tell someone why you like it and the, that you think might like it themselves. It's probably not everyone's cup of tea, but I'm okay with that. Maybe someday it will be. That would be a beautiful thing. And I'm going to play us out with a song by Quilla, Q W I L L A, bass on SoundCloud, Quilla Bass. 
It just goes by Quilla, but the SoundCloud URL is Quilla Bass, as in B-A-S-S. And uh, the song is called Higher Selves. Cool track. Had a nice conversation with this guy on SoundCloud a couple of days ago. Cool dude. Support him. And I'm out. You guys are awesome. Talk to you next week. Thanks for being here. And uh, I guess cheers. <laughs>